Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Corumbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Eliana Johnson of National Review and for Jim Garrity today, I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, crazy martinis for conservatives as usual. And Eliana, it's not often we get some of the characters in the Three Martini Lunch that we have today. Starting in the good martini, Howard Dean was on MSNBC. Those two phrases don't usually mean good things for conservatives, but they might in this case because they were talking about the Kentucky Senate race. And obviously Democrats don't have many bright spots for picking up a seat, but they think they've got a shot to take out Mitch McConnell. Allison Lundergan Grimes is the uh, Democratic nominee in waiting there. And Howard Dean was trying to make the point that Mitch McConnell really can't run against Obamacare because Kentucky's Obamacare exchange was perhaps the most well-running exchange in the country, and therefore a lot of people in Kentucky who didn't have health care before can have it now. And Howard Dean says, let's nationalize that strategy. That's got to be a factor here. You're going to see this all over the country. In fact, you already are seeing this all over the country. There was a poll today where folks suggested that we ought to be on the offensive on Obamacare. We ought to be supporting it. We ought to be proud that we supported it because it is, in fact, uh, providing people with health care. Nobody knows that better than the people of Kentucky. Eliana, how much are Republicans hoping the Democrats listen to Howard Dean? The Kentucky Senate race is certainly an interesting one. Uh, Allison uh, Lundergan Grimes is very much Mitch McConnell's opposite. You know, she's a young woman. She's very much a blank slate, whereas Mitch McConnell, uh, people know everything about him. But I think uh, if there's one thing that he doesn't have to be worried about is that he's going to lose on the issue of Obamacare. What do you think the Democrats are going to do here? Do you think they just try to talk in in vague terms about how they'd like to fix certain things? Do you think uh, if some of these numbers from certain states, maybe like Kentucky, turn out okay, that they'll uh, try to roll the dice? And since that is basically their signature issue of the last six years, that they've got to run on it, what do you expect them to actually do here? I think the only way for them to talk about it as a campaign issue is to say that the alternative is for us to go back to nothing, that the Republicans don't have a plan and and it's uh, the current plan. Um, with all of its flaws or nothing. I do think that that's the way for Democrats to go on the offensive about it. And and I think you will see that. Do you expect that to work, whether it's Kentucky or any other competitive state? I think it depends on how the Republican candidates in each state respond. I think it's something that could potentially work. It's, you know, it's something of a scare tactic, but um, we'll see how prepared the Republicans in uh, in each state are uh, to respond to those sorts of allegations. Oh, they wouldn't have scare tactics during an election year, Eliana. I don't know what you're uh, referring to there. (laughs) All right. On to uh, the bad martini now. And this broke yesterday. This particular report comes to us from uh, townhall.com. According to new IRS emails obtained through a Freedom of Information Act request from Judicial Watch, former head of tax-exempt groups at the IRS, Lois Lerner, was in contact with the Department of Justice in May of 2013 about whether tax-exempt groups could be criminally prosecuted for lying about political activity. There's this whole slew of emails that came out here. I got a call today from Richard Pilger, Director of Elections Crimes Branch at DOJ. He wanted to know who at IRS, the DOJ folks, could talk to about Senator Whitehouse's idea at the hearing that DOJ could piece together false statement cases about applicants who lied on their forms saying they weren't planning on doing political activity and then turning around and making large visible political expenditures. Other people in the email chain say, hey, great idea. Ultimately, it never happened. And a couple months later, the inspector general's report came out and blew up this whole uh, process at the IRS. What do you make of the connection here between Lerner and the Department of Justice? Look, I think there are a lot of things that we can fault Lois Lois Lerner for. She obviously uh, has not acted like a model citizen throughout um, all of these events, but I don't think this is one of them. I think this is an instance in which we had a Democratic senator, Sheldon Whitehouse, going to the Justice Department and suggesting that they prosecute 501c4 groups who may have broken the law, um, is my understanding. And if that's the case, fine, go ahead and prosecute them. Um, I don't think Lerner did anything wrong by following up on a request from the Justice Department. If we have qualms with this, it should be with the push from Democratic senators to prosecute groups that may or may not have broken the law. I think that's that's the issue that we should be focusing on. Like the uh, scrutiny in the first place, it seems, at least from part of these email chains, that there isn't much interest in going after left-leaning groups who are claiming tax-exempt status but are engaging in political activities. It seems to go one direction again. 
Sure. I mean, but in this case, the push wasn't coming from the IRS. The push was coming from a Democratic senator in the Justice Department. So I think uh, the focus is better put there. And, and of course, when it's being instigated by a Democratic senator, he's certainly going to be focused on right-leaning groups. So um, I think the person at fault here is uh, Rhode Island's Sheldon Whitehouse and uh, really not Lois Lerner, who who in the email said, uh, look, these these cases aren't going to go anywhere. Obviously, the Department of Justice is supposed to be investigating the whole IRS scandal. The Ways and Means Committee referred Lerner to them for a criminal prosecution. I don't think there were a lot of high hopes on the right for them to do much with that either. But now that we see the Department of Justice in on this side of the, the story, do you expect even less from the Justice Department in following up on the Lerner uh, prosecution? Um, I did not expect Eric Holder to uh, prosecute Lois Lerner in the first place, so I don't know how much my expectations could fall from that. (laughs) Uh, So, uh, no, it doesn't really change my view of the likelihood that that, uh, the Holder Justice Department is going to prosecute Lois Lerner. That was about zero to begin with. All right, on to the crazy martini now. And of all the names you expected to show up here today, could have been Putin, could have been a couple of other people. No, Anthony Weiner. Anthony Weiner is now a columnist uh, for a a business publication. And he was talking to uh, Spanish language uh, media host Jorge Ramos about this. And they talked a lot about his uh, new work and whether that's uh, a full time job. They talked about a little bit about his fall from grace. And then came this question from Ramos. Have you stopped sexting? And, and that's a question that I'm sure everyone's asking. Uh, I'm a, look, I, I'm a private citizen now. I, I frankly recognize that I have a political background that has a biography that's attached to it that I live with. So one thing I have decided that I'm going to not do from the, you know, unless I, uh-huh. I return to public life is start to go into the rabbit hole of having conversations about my personal life again. I think of anything at this point in my career, I've earned the right to say it's none of your business. Translation, Eliana? Um, translation, <laughs> you know, I think who knows? Who knows what he's doing? But I think if he doesn't want to be asked those sorts of questions, you know, don't do uh, national television interviews. That seems to me to be the obvious thing. But Anthony Weiner is obviously a pathological person who can't get out of the way of a TV camera, get himself in front of a TV camera fast enough, and yet uh, seems unwilling to answer the obvious questions people have for him. Uh, he's, you know, a bizarre human being. <laughs> And, of course, that's what got him in trouble. Uh, he promised that he wasn't going to do it again, and then obviously it was discovered that he had. And so uh, now basically pleading the fifth in the public arena might be the smartest thing he can do, especially if he's actually trying to at least make some people believe that he's moved on. But, uh, well, on that uh, sordid note, there's not any other note you can close on if Anthony Weiner's the subject. Uh, Eliana, have a great day. We'll talk to you later. Talk to you later. Eliana Johnson of National Review. And for Jim Garrity today, I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. We will be off tomorrow for a good Friday. Jim and I will be here on Monday for the next edition of the Three Martini Lunch. <laughs>